we have the power to blip a black hole into existence, then we should have the power to blip it out of existence. So, so I think um, most of that sounds reasonable to me. And, 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 and <laughs> it, it, it does. We finally did something reasonable. <laughs> I don't know about that. But regardless, welcome to the season finale of Dead Planet Society from New Scientist. I'm Chelsea White. And I'm Leia Crane, and this episode, we are going on an adventure, and we're taking the whole solar system with us. We get to see so little of the cosmos, so little of our own galaxy even, that it only seems sensible that we would try to find a way to take a road trip through the universe. (laughs) And we don't want Earth to die on the way, obviously, (laughs) so we'll have to take our star with us, and if we're doing that, we might as well bring the other planets too. It's a cosmic jaunt. Thing (laughs) is, if we move the sun, everything should go with it. If we get it right. Moving the sun is no easy task, though. We can't just chuck it into a wormhole. I mean, yeah, first of all, they don't exist. (laughs) Yes, I am well aware of that. (laughs) Even if there could be a traversable wormhole big enough for the whole solar system to go through, which there couldn't, uh, it would collapse as soon as the outer edges started to go in. Wormholes, useless. You heard it here, folks. (laughs) Wormholes are canceled. So we're going to have to get a little more creative. And to do that, we called up Jay Farihi at University College London to see if any of our wacky ideas are possible. Well, loosely plausible, at (laughs) least. So the first thing I have to ask you is, if we do move the sun slowly enough, and I don't know what slowly enough means, (laughs) will the whole solar system go with it? So when you say sufficiently slowly, would everything come with us? The answer is definitely yes. Sufficiently slowly could be really, really really, really slowly. But (laughs) the answer is yes. If it were sufficiently slowly, yes, everything would come. And I think that's uh, one of the trickiest parts is not unbinding ourselves from from the sun, for example, or unbinding any of the other planets. I got to be honest, I um, could not care less about taking the other planets with. No, come on. I guess Jupiter, that's gravitationally important, but everything else... Okay, so just not to go off on too many tangents, uh, Jupiter is a big bully. Um, <laughs> yes, basically, the asteroid belt is wants to be a planet, and uh, not only is Jupiter preventing this family of objects from coming together in one big family and becoming like <laughs> a Mar- Mars-sized planet, Jupiter actively kicks them around and destroys them, either throws them out of the solar system or into the sun. However, Ju- Jupiter also protects us from... Uh, stuff coming from the outer solar system and, and hitting the Earth. So, love-hate relationship? Yeah, uh, we need Earth and Jupiter. Yeah, but especially because if we're going to move through space that we are not currently in, we might encounter some things. I think we need the other planets for safety. It's true. So, um, one of the things that I could say is um, this is something I didn't think about, how important each of the bodies in the solar system might be to our happiness and survival. <laughs> one thing I did think about is uh, one of the major sources of comets in the solar system, which could bring us water someday if we run out. Um, that's really loosely bound to the solar system. So I think we would lose 90 to 99% of those no matter what we did. They're just so loosely bound. You kind of breathe on them and they become unbound. But the major planets are much more strongly bound. So we lose the Oort cloud. That's okay with me. I think we're just going to have to assume that anything we do, we want to accelerate real slowly. And eventually we could be going pretty fast. Yeah. I will say, I don't have a lot of patience. That's one of my biggest problems. <laughs> yeah. And I want to know, do we know how slowly we'd have to go? Or is that an impossible to answer question? I think I think the answer is yes. So there's, there's two considerations. And one is um, what we call the binding energy. So just basically to the force of Newtonian gravity, how much is the strength of that reaction? And obviously you don't want to overcome it. On a given mass, force is equivalent to an acceleration. So there will be some finite acceleration that would overcome Newtonian gravity. And the other thing that um, maybe you haven't thought about, which (laughs) could justify my contribution here, is that um, we know the planets go around the sun, but it's not so obvious to most people that the sun 
makes a small circle. It's not a perfect circle because there's lots of planets. It's basically going around the circle in an orbit with Jupiter and its center of mass. So Jupiter is orbiting the center of mass and the sun is orbiting that center of mass. And it's a very small circle for the sun because the sun is much larger. But we'd have to be careful about when we pushed because if <laughs> if Jupiter oh. or the Earth, if the Earth is going this way at the time and the sun is going this way, that would be a little bit of extra danger. But I think you can plan for that. So okay. So you'd right. want to think about when you're pu- pushing on the swing at the at the right time and not the wrong time. Okay. So then let's talk about some ideas for how to move the sun because we have a lot of them. <laughs> I want to know what you think about this because as when I thought about this, of course, I thought about the sun kind of moving pretty quickly, which we have just found out is not a good idea. But <laughs> I wanted to know if we had the magic power, which we grant ourselves here, to sort of like tug down on space time in, in front of the sun and let it sort of slide into this well that we've made. Could we make kind of a space time luge and get it just sort of going? <laughs> This is the solar warp drive idea. Yeah. (laughs) And then once it has some momentum, it would just kind of keep going, I assume. Well, that is a good point. And that is one of the ways I was thinking about it. I think we often see demonstrations um, when black holes are in the game of, you know, pushing on a fabric and making a big dent in space time and that kind of propagates. And so then, you know, slowly dragging the planets because they're in that well or in that dip with you. And I I think that makes sense. I think the acceleration is the key and, you know, doing it slowly enough and achieving that. But but I I think it's feasible. It's also worth remembering, we're actually moving right now towards a few other stars and away from some other stars. I think the nearest close encounter will happen in like a million years, but it's not close by... Earth, earthling standards. <laughs> Not if we have anything to say about it. A million yeah. years is a long time. <laughs> yeah. So, so I don't know if I should throw this into the mix now, but I was saying <laughs> I, it would be easier if we had like, you know, we're on a road and there's some, you know, there's a, there's a food stop over there and there's a, I don't know, coffee shop over there. So steering towards a goal would probably be easier than like pointing us back in the other direction from where we're coming from because the entire solar system is moving at roughly 20, 25 kilometers per second, which, you know, human beings don't have a good feeling for this. Even I don't, but it's pretty fast. Yeah. I think we, I think we want to speed up. I think. Yeah. I was going to say, it sounds like we're not starting a process. We're just speeding one up that's currently happening. Yeah. If, and if, if we're going in that direction and we kind of push or, or, you know, turn a little bit, I think that that would be helpful. Yeah. I think going faster sounds a lot cooler yeah, than absolutely. slowing down. <laughs> but, okay. Well, then you haven't thought the problem of what we're going to do when we get when we, where we want to go, but no, maybe we just get in a spaceship and hop, hop off then. I don't know. Yeah, watch the the complete explosion, the the absolute collision we're about to set off. We're gonna, just going to watch stuff go by. Um, so I want to <laughs> go back to the putting a black hole next to the sun okay. idea because I love a gravity tractor. Okay. Um, but it feels like, and, and for the sake of this podcast, we're creating a black hole and just putting it where we need it. But it seems like then you have to move the black hole that we're using for the gravity tractor, which seems even harder than moving the sun. Yes, and you have to move it continuously. <laughs> so, so at first I thought, well, like, well, how do we get the black hole there without destroying the Earth? And but okay, let's just plop it there. We we have a team in <laughs> team in space making black holes as you do. <laughs> and so what happens is the sun starts to orbit the black hole. Depending on the mass, the more massive, the faster the orbit around the black hole. So, you know, you want to pull it, but the sun wants to come around. So I I think it's feasible with enough speed. If you're going faster than Kepler's laws, then it would never catch up and and it would never circle. So it would just follow. You'd have to create it with momentum, though. 
Yeah, I was going to say if, if you want to bring it with, because otherwise, like I said, the sun starts circling, but you, you could wait, you know, the sun starts circling it and then you get in the right position. And then, then if you can accelerate the black hole again, faster than the orbital speed of the sun, you could drag it. That's um, not maybe as slow as you would want um, to get the earth to be dragged along, but you know, one problem at a time. So I think- But now I have a question. If we can, if we have the power to blip a black hole into existence, then we should have the power to blip it out of existence. So could we put it near the sun and for long enough that the sun starts to orbit around it, get rid of it and let the sun continue on its trajectory now that it has gained some momentum? So so I think um, most of that sounds reasonable to me. And, 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 and <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it does, uh, it does, but I guess then it's it's that small acceleration and making sure the planets uh, come along. And because if the black hole is close enough to the sun, then all the planets see just um, an increase in the sun's mass. So their their orbits go a little bit faster is, is what would happen. The, the planets wouldn't come towards the black hole. They, they would just... Mm. They would just speed up. <laughs> so that's good news. Um, I think you just have to make sure that the acceleration is is a little bit of nudge. So I think that sounds plausible. If it's a small enough acceleration, we should basically change course. Does this mean that we kind of change time too? I don't think so. No, but if our orbit speeds up even ever so slightly, have we lost some time? Oh, you mean the calendar year? Yeah, not physically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the seasons would change. That's, <laughs> but but you know, let's just say sufficiently slowly is a possibility. But yeah, that there, there is that. But we had this other idea about how to move the sun, which was to use a sun sail, right? So, I but it then sounds the, so simple. The, the, but the sail moves. How do you bring the sun with you? The sun pushes on the sail. Yeah, so we'd have to attach it to the sun somehow, and I'm really not sure how we might do that. <laughs> um, but if we could, couldn't the sun like power its own little trip? It could be its own sort of gasoline to to move itself. So I just thought this through right now. Uh, it could be totally wrong, but I think that's in the spirit of this podcast. Um, <laughs> I, I think okay, <laughs> that's a, I take that as positive. Um, I think if you built the sail on one side so that the area of the sail is quite large, it should be the pressure is proportional to the area of the sail. And then if you put on another side a smaller sail, that would create pressure in both directions and it might have an unequal pressure and keep the star going in one direction because it's pushing against the sail. So as the sail tries to come closer it has an equal and opposite force. Now, I don't know if that would work, but in principle, more forward pressure and less rear pressure could lead to a differential. Uh, total speculation. We might have to put thrusters on the sails to, to sort of keep that calibrated. Yeah, uh, you know, that definitely couldn't hurt just getting the areas perfectly right. You might want to have corrections because the sun does have hiccups and stuff like that. So, But that's an idea. We don't even need to connect it to the sun. If we just had thrusters to keep it, well, no, it's got to tug it, right? Yeah. Well, my yeah. other idea about this was, you know, normally with with light sails, you want to make them incredibly um, light yes, so that they can move quickly. But what if we made it super massive so that we're basically creating something that's having pressure from the sun yeah. and gravitationally pulling the sun along with it? I don't, I don't think you can get both. Uh, I, because right, it, basically, if it's too massive, it won't move in response to the light pressure. So it basically, its inertia is too high if it has a lot of mass. But what if it's really? But if, I mean, if you want to make a, a sail out of black hole material, then I, I just don't think you need the sa the sail. Effect. <laughs> you don't need the sail at that <laughs> yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> but if it were really light and it were a sail, help me picture it. If we could ever make this, would it have to be like? wider than the diameter of the sun yes how big would yeah, it have to be like quite, 10 quite times a... wider a thousand times wider yeah so this is where i, I haven't I haven't thought this through and like i said um a, sa a sail ahead and a sail behind whether that would work i can't say but i think it would have to be quite massive proportions to move something like that because of the sails that i've seen in either realistic science fiction or 
discussions of these kinds of things. I think the spacecraft has to be incredibly light for sails that are like the size of, I don't know, I want to say like Lake Baikal in Russia or something like that. You have many, many thousands of square kilometers. And then just like it's one person in a, I don't know, in a in a oil drum, <laughs> you know, something like that. Right. And our solar system is heavy. Yeah, the, the, the sun is a little bit heavier than that. So the reason I ask is, if we make a sail big enough to create enough pressure to actually move the sun, wouldn't we be blocking out like most of the sun for part of the year? Like we're yeah. losing the whole point of well, keeping the not sun. Not if we do us. it outside of Earth's orbit. Yeah. If, oh. if, if, you, if you so, if you tried to move everything in this direction, you know, orthogonal to the plane of the solar system, that, that's actually a good point. What, what she said. I hadn't thought about that, but now that it's uh, cats out of the bag, I think that's uh, because then you don't interfere with the direction of the orbits. Kepler's laws in principle, they're all doing the same thing. For our listeners, orthogonal means perpendicular. Yeah. Right. So the plane, the flat plane of the solar system. The almost flat plane, yeah. Yes, the almost flat plane. <laughs> we wouldn't put it in that line. We would put it away from that line like up above the sun, kind of, yeah, if you're it, thinking about it in a mobile. It just occurred to me based on what Leia said, and I think that sounds like it would avoid some of the stickier situations. Yeah, it would still block out, like, like you wouldn't be able to see other stars, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's okay. We can lose some stars if we're going on a fantastical universe journey. <laughs> okay. Well, I think, you know, none of our solutions are going to be perfect, but uh, once, we get near, <laughs> once we get near other stars, they're going to push back on our sail. So, oh well, then we just blow it up. I mean, maybe we just want to move into an empty parking spot. We don't want to. We don't need a star. We have our own star. We're just moving to a new empty spot. So, but do we do we necessarily park? Like once we get it going, is it going to slow down real quick or just keep on? If you turn it around, it should. If we got us going, <laughs> we just anyway. If this crazy idea has any merit, I think that that's logically consistent. I had one more idea if, um, I don't know Mm -hmm. if this is the right time. It's also, you know, out there, but I just tried to ask myself what I could think of. (laughs) And I thought um, if we have, bear with me, graviton generators. So, I mean, it's just like like a flashlight, except it it had gravity particles come out. Um, Mm -hmm. The force carrier for gravity should be a particle called the graviton. Nobody's uh, detected it. it. probably is wrong, but but in principle, if the standard model of physics is correct. So if you had a graviton generator, and if you're kind of like thinking of terms of Dyson sphere, if you made something like a Dyson sphere or part of one uh, around the solar system that you wanted to take with you, I think then you're in business because then you can basically, you know, push and pull um, all you need to do is pull, but maybe people who make gravitons can learn how to make gravity push when they want it to. <laughs> I mean, th- I mean that sounds a little bit crazy. It's not just surrounding the Earth or surrounding the Sun. It's you know surrounding everything out to let's say Jupiter's orbit or something like that. Right. So uh, the tr- the my traditional traditional <laughs> sort of understanding of a Dyson sphere, <laughs> it's always a picture of like um, kind of a cage around a star that's like. Yeah. Uh, taking in the energy. Yes. And all, all of the planet's mass has probably gone into that. So there's no more planets. It's just all, um, yeah. But so you're suggesting that we make a mega Dyson sphere. Well, maybe it doesn't need to be that big, but we have we need to have enough graviton beams to basically make an engine and pull us in the direction that we want and push us. And it's not a thrust, you know, a, a traditional or any imagined thruster. I'm just imagining using the force of gravity itself to... Yeah, basically cut us out of the local gravity field and create the field that we want for the motion and trajectory that we want. It it maybe sounds a little bit far-fetched, but I think if you were masters of gravity, then... Which we are. Right. (laughs) Okay, so it's a really big scale, but I don't know. Yeah, This is a car. Yeah, we're we're, 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 we're we're turning us into a yeah a vehicle. It's a, it's this a, is a it's solar a, it's system a fabric car. of fabric of space time vehicle. Can I just argue that if we're going to make a Dyson sphere big enough to encapsulate everything out to Jupiter's orbit, 
Could we just be a little bigger and take the outer planets too? They're nice. I, I don't I see like Saturn one. a lot. I don't know. Well, let's. <laughs> I'll look at the budget and I'll talk to okay. the team and uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> thank you. Make thank it you a little bit more NSF money this year. Maybe we can we can bring Saturn. I think there's a good right. argument for Saturn. You're going to have to come yeah. up with bigger arguments for the ice giants. They haven't. Done, I don't care about those done guys. much for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in the last episode, we just uh, mined that Destroyed. Uranus for <laughs> yes. its diamonds. So nice. it's gone already. Nice. Uh, the thing I'm wondering is if we are making this, for lack of a better description, giant space car. Yeah. Um, could, why can't we just put regular thrusters on it? Well, I, I think I think the 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 reason that I thought of is just because if you're moving a planet or a star, right? It has all those implications about Kepler's laws and whether an acceleration will unbind things. But here we're thrusting against the fabric of space time. So we're not moving through space. We're basically bringing space with us. That is so cool. Mm. Okay. Let's just say to, to, to some degree, to some degree, right? We're we're, we're, we're dragging the fabric of space time with us. If you're doing with gravity, if Einstein is correct, then we are creating fabric of the fabric of space time that we want as we move. That's pretty I mean, cool. he was a, right a lot. I feel like we. So, f- so, f- so far. <laughs> <laughs> Infuriatingly correct yeah. about almost everything. I guess now that I think about it, if we were to build giant space car and then put regular thrusters on it and not drag space time along the, everything would just, you just hit everything. The engines would move. The engines would move, but the planets wouldn't move with them. If you're just doing regular thrusting, right? Everything would just get bunched up at the back of the space. Yeah. Car. They're, they're, what, they're, what are they th- thrusting against? Right. The, the, the thrusters would move, but if they're not pushing the planets or the sun, if they're not connected to them, just the thrusters, the engines move. It would be like if you were in a car and when it accelerated, you flew out the back windshield, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go with the car. The car would <laughs> you, go. You would. Yeah. Yeah. We're just going to end up gathering the whole solar system into one giant clump. Yeah, when I was a kid, I always, I always thought as a kid that if I jumped up on the bus, you know, the bus would keep moving and I wouldn't. But that's before I understood momentum. But if the bus driver accelerates at the right time, now I know if I could go back to being seven – and I could get the bus driver to like hit the accelerator while I jump, then maybe he could, you know, hurt me. <laughs> and, and you know, and in, the, in a law, law, lawsuit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'd probably go to jail for giant space car. Now we have a special offer for Dead Planet Society listeners. You can get a 10-week digital subscription for $10 or £10, which includes unlimited access to our website and app. To learn more, go to newscientist.com slash DPS offer. And if you enjoy our podcast, you might also enjoy my free monthly space newsletter at New Scientist, Launchpad. Check it out at newscientist.com slash launchpad. And if you love eclipses, New Scientist Discovery Tours now has two new eclipse tours live on our website, one going to Greenland in 2026 and another sailing the Nile in 2027. Go to newscientist.com slash tours to find out more. Okay, this is my favorite idea. Um, because if I think of the sun as a big ball of heat and pressure, which feels reasonable. That's true. Maybe I could poke a hole in it. So some of its plasma shoots out of that hole and acts as a sort of internally generated thruster. Well, I wanted to talk about it because, um, I wanted to say that it won't work. (laughs) No, (laughs) it's so the blue. The sun is not like a balloon that you untie and then it flies around the room. So, okay. So there's no surface to the sun. Um, The last visible surface in stars we call the photosphere, photo meaning just photons. And it's it's just defined when um, basically there's, uh, we can't see through any further. That's what astronomers define the visible surface of stars. And that's where we say that's what the temperature is because obviously the temperature gets higher when you go in. So you can't like poke a hole in a gas. This is a gas or plasma. It's just a bunch of stuff floating around. You, know, you put your finger, pull your finger out and the, it, the gas just reoccupies. I mean, your finger is obviously burned really badly, but. <laughs> but what if I took a giant fireproof cosmic straw? I 
stay with me. I was going to say some <laughs> kind of nozzle might work here. Yeah. <laughs> and poke it all the way to the center where the pressure is higher. And it's fireproof and indestructible. Would stuff shoot out of it? So um, that's interesting. So in the in the core where fusion is happening, uh, the photons are generally higher energy than uh, when they emerge. I can't remember, but it takes something like a 10,000 years for a photon that's um, come from fusion to emerge from the surface due to many, many times of being absorbed and re-emitted, absorbed and re-emitted. So I think in, in principle, you're right that there's much higher pressure there. That's true. Um, and definitely the temperature is higher. So I guess in, in principle, that could work. The problem that then happens is how do you maintain that? Because in stars, uh, we have this thing called hydrostatic equilibrium, which means that the inward force of gravity is balanced by the outward pressure um, that results from fusion and these photons. It's like a, it's almost like a fluid pressure. So that, that's the problem is maintaining that, that nozzle. And I don't know how forceful it would be. Well, we want to accelerate slow anyway. That's true. Also, how quick until the sun goes out? <laughs> yeah, are we shrinking the sun? Because that feels bad. I didn't think about that. <laughs> well, you could be, you could be ex extending its life. So if oh. we were to remove mass <laughs> from our sun, how benevolent of us! <laughs> if we remove mass from our sun, uh, that means that the pressure in the core is smaller and uh, the rate of fusion is lower. So the reservoir of hydrogen is depleted more slowly. So this is why teeny tiny red dwarf stars live for the age of the universe times many thing, I don't know, hundred thousand times more. And stars that are more massive than our sun burn out more quickly is because the rate is much higher. So the, you, you could be onto something there. So less fast, less furious. We get to live forever and we get to see the whole universe. Yeah, I think it's just well, hard. Well, we being the sun, not yeah. Earth or us. I mean, the problem is the sun, spi the sun spins, so your spigot would spin. Oh, but yeah. it'd be, it'd make some nice fireworks. <laughs> This is back to the balloon blasting around the room problem. <laughs> yeah, we're just going to yeah. go nowhere. We're just going to spin around in a little circle and then we end up back where but we were. But it would be, pre it would be pretty. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, that's an argument for it. it be, um, we'd have crazy auroras probably because yeah. of all oh. those charged particles. Yeah. That would be cool. But, you know, if you did, you know, manage to put something like a, a rogue planet came, you know, smashing through the solar system and went right through the sun. I think it would, the whole, the whole would, would close up pretty quickly. Right. So we need the indestructible space straw. Yeah, I think so. Well, that seems fine. If that works, <laughs> if that works or the luge works or the solar sailor works, if one, one of these plans works, Jay, I want to know where should we go? Where, where would you like to go with our solar system all the way around us? Well, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, if, if the sun is still good for us, then we don't need to find a new sun uh, that we could like hop over to, like parking next to a new sun that we want to move to when our sun is gone. Then uh, I would like um, a nice view. Yeah, I want to go to a nebula. Yeah, I so, want the yeah I want to see the pillars of creation up yeah. close. I mean, it's a little bit tricky because uh, if we come too close, then they can uh, basically you know interact with our solar system in a bad in a bad way. So like you know, I think like having a, a globular cluster in the sky would be pretty freaking amazing because that's yeah. like it's not just a few stars, it's not just a necklace of stars or constellation. It's like you know a Carl Sagan billions and billions of stars. That's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. But if we get too close, then it'll pull us in and smash it. No, no. I think, I think that's the great thing about globular clusters is we can already see them um, with mortal telescopes these days. So I don't think you have to get that close where you could see a good portion of it with uh, in a safe range. I, I'm speculating, but I don't know. Did you, what did you two have some ideas of where you'd like to go? Yeah, I really, I really would like to go next to a nebula, but I, I want to see it with the naked eye in the sky. And I feel like getting that close is running some radiation risks. Also running incredible meteor showers every night. Um, I don't mind dust. that. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know how close you'd have to be. I think you could probably find a safe range. The, the reason why nebulae glow is usually because uh, stars, other stars are shining on them and making them glow. So I think we could 
we could still be far away and, and see the glow, I, th- I think. And then we could, we could like, you know, have a, a nebula of the millennium and then we could move to another one and another because we'd have our space car and we could do whatever we wanted. <laughs> I think this is a terrible idea, a truly bad idea, but I would love to get close up, close-ish up to a supermassive black hole. Oh, like at the center of our galaxy. Yeah. Like I want to go see one real close. I want to see what that guy's doing. Yeah. um, It's like going back to see the dinosaurs. It's very attractive. And it's also like I keep thinking about that scene in Interstellar where they get close by and like the way the light bends and yeah. how wild it looks like. I want to see that. Okay. We, we, we definitely could not get that close. Not with a star <laughs> on the planets. I do kind of feel like we're going to have consequences. Um. <laughs> when, you, when you're near a black hole, you get, you get t- tidal <laughs> gravity. So, you know, yeah. the, the reason why tides happen is because, you know, one side of the earth gets tugged on more than the other side. So if we're too close to the black hole, then it's going to pull on one side of the solar system more than the other. And it, it might chew up a, a few outer planets. We got a couple to spare. It's yeah. fine. <laughs> well, we would have we calculated to take that into account. Yeah. We, we've, we've made ourselves masters of gravity, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We get to all wear silly hats. And go on the best road trip anyone's ever imagined. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm in. I'll bring snacks. That's it for this season of Dead Planet Society. Thank you all for going on this epic journey with us. Before we leave, just a quick correction from last time. We said that we were burning Uranus to see what it's made of, and that's called mass spectroscopy, but it's actually called emission spectroscopy. Sorry about that. Thank you to listener Winslow for the catch. If you're going to miss us in your feeds, there's still an opportunity this year for more Dead Planet Society. We'll be doing a show in London at New Scientist Live this October. Visit NewScientistLive.com to get tickets to see us and the rest of the incredible Festival of Ideas. And if you've got any ideas yourself for how we might destroy the universe, or if you just want to send us compliments on our incredible scientific supervillainry, our email is deadplanets at NewScientist.com. Thank you all for listening. Bye. We got a police escort, but it's gravity. Something like that. This is the first time I haven't felt like gravity was my mortal enemy in one of these. Like, gravity's usually fighting us so hard. Yeah. And this time, it's really helping us out.